Hello, welcome back to Building Integrity. I'm your host, Josh Porter, and today we're going back to Champlain Towers South. The a couple days ago, um, the lawsuits all pretty much settled. Most of them settled for a, a record amount of almost $1 billion. They're expecting it to go over a billion dollars. I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard about this on the news and in the newspapers. Um, but what I wanted to mainly focus on in this video today, because we've talked a lot about that lawsuit, but right before it settled, there were some um, additional answers and interrogatories, if you will, that were responded to as part of these lawsuits that included some, some new photos that really hadn't been seen by anybody uh, in the public sphere. And these are photos that were, uh, according to the lawsuit, allegedly taken uh, just two weeks and like a couple days before the building collapsed. And they're very interesting photos. And we're gonna go through those in detail in this video. So stick around, I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, I also wanna give a shout out to the uh, writers at the Miami Herald, their names will be in the description. Um, we worked together a lot. I answered their questions and they helped me to really think about um, things that I hadn't considered and to really look at things. Um, the other thing that was really beneficial is, uh, and you'll see me refer to this uh, confidential source uh, in this video, is that the, uh, they were able to provide me with some new information I hadn't had before um, uh, coming from a confidential source that they had. Now they may, uh, by the time this video comes out, they may have already written their article um, and they may or may not uh, um, uh, reveal who that confidential source is. We're not going to uh, talk about it much more or, or try to guess who it is. That's not really the point, but we're going to talk about some of the things that this person described seeing and hearing um, and share some of the photos that they have provided that are the photos themselves are confidential. So I don't have those, but we're going to discuss what I saw. Um, and so let's just go ahead and get into it because I think this stuff's really interesting. So the photo you see here, again, these photos were, uh, according to the metadata, and this is what the attorney stated in, the, in their write-up, that according to the metadata, these photos were taken um, June 8th, 2021. And what we're looking at here is we're looking at the planter box. Uh, to, if you, if you, and I'll get back to the drawings here later in this, in this video, and I'll kind of orient you all. But we're looking at the planter box to the west of the um, uh, pool deck area. The person taking the photograph is standing toward the north end of the pool deck facing south, all right? And what we're seeing, it's a little blurry in here. We lose some of that detail, but we have some close-up photos of that corner uh, that I'll show you in a second. But essentially what I want you to look at is that we have this long horizontal crack uh, going down the length of this planter wall. And the crack is really interesting because it's located right between the masonry course, the bottom masonry course, which is about eight inches. I'm sorry, I don't have that in metric for you, um, for, for my international viewers, but most uh, uh, CMU, which is a cement masonry unit, uh, concrete or masonry block construction consists of eight inch uh, lifts. And the, the rest of this seems to be very solid and in excellent condition. Now there's no details in the construction drawings for how these planter box wall, uh, walls were built, but uh, based on the fact that this wall, the lower portion has cracks here and it has some cracking here, and you'll see that there's you know cracking in block, you can see the block here, but the fact uh, at the corner, but the fact that this upper area here has no stair step cracking, no stress in it, leads me to believe that this is probably a solid poured concrete beam. It's not uncommon to do this, or at least it's a lintel beam, a masonry beam. And I'm not gonna get into the details between a masonry beam and a concrete beam, but for all intents and purposes, it's a relatively rigid beam that's going to resist uh, cracking. And so uh, it's not immune to it, but it's going to resist it compared to regular CMU. So it looks like this upper portion here may be a solid pour or, or some sort of a structural beam. Now the next photo, and you can see these photos, there's a couple photos that were taken very closely together. Um, so in this photo, there's a gentleman in the, in the photo, he's standing near the corner that we're interested in. Uh, in this photo, they took another one, he's beginning to uh, move the trash can out of the way for the photographer to get in. Now, according to the lawsuit, these were photos taken by staff at, uh, at Morabito or Morabito, however you wanna pronounce it. Um, but it was these photos were taken by their staff, that is uh, public knowledge at this point. Um, so he's moving the trash can out of the way, and then they take another photo of the area. You can sort of see the rust staining, you know, where the trash can has been sitting there for year after year. Um, and, uh, and again, you don't really gain any extra detail other than we see this long horizontal crack. Now, this is really interesting, um, but I'll get to why it's so interesting uh, in, in a couple more slides here. Okay, so now we're at the corner. 
Okay, so we're basically, the next photo is gonna be standing here and looking this way. And so now we're standing at the corner and we're taking one photo down and you can see this the uh, the masonry block. So here's one uh, uh, block of, of masonry uh, and then here's a second block of masonry. And then this is mortar that's in between the, the block and the course. And in fact, you can actually see that there's a void space in here, which is typical of an unfilled uh, 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 mortar block. So we're looking down now, you can see the red brick here. Okay, and so we're looking just to kind of orient you to the photo. We're looking down. We're looking down the face of the wall with this other photo. It's a very weird orientation. I have no idea. I guess they took it so that they could try to to to, to observe this uh, void space in here and get that in the camera because that that would be the only angle you could do that to show that it's a hollow cell there. Okay, but you can see that they peeled away some of the um they peeled away some of the stucco off of this wall and they've exposed some of that masonry down here, but this joint otherwise is wide open. I mean, this, this thing has broken apart. We can see that there are stress cracks uh, in the masonry down here, but again, above the masonry, we don't see any stress cracks in the upper portion of the wall, which kind of leads me to believe that, well, this is possibly a solid poured beam across the top here. And then of course, across the top over here as well. All right. Now they take another photo of this corner, which is probably the most telling photos of all. And again, we can see our, our two masonry block units here on the right picture. We can see the first block unit that was in that other photo. We can see the second block unit. And then we can see that the crack is wide open here. And if you go back a couple slides, we can actually deduce from looking at the photos, even though they're kind of low resolution, and I'm sorry, this is the best resolution I have, but it appears that this crack actually comes to a close somewhere right before the end of the of the uh, uh, image. So you have a very, uh, at, the, at this end, you have a very wide open crack and like, like as if this was the measurement, right, between. And then over here, you've got a smaller, it's not quite as open. And then over here, it gets even smaller. And then over here, it comes down to a close, okay? And so it's sort of, and I'm exaggerating this, but it sort of creates a, a, a wedge-like crack, if you will. That's, that's going to be important for looking at and analyzing the rest of these photos. All right, and so here is, is of course, again, is the widest part of this crack. Now, what's interesting about this particular, these two particular photos is if we, if we look at the upper left area and we kind of, you know, this zoomed in image, if we look at this area here, we can see that what we have what we call a vertical uh, displacement be across this crack. And so what I mean is that this surface of the crack here is here, but its matching point is down here. And so there's, there's, I mean, this thing is almost like a, I don't know, maybe maybe three centimeters of, of, of gap, I would guess. And, and, you know, that's a little over an inch of gap uh, for, my, for my imperial people there, <laughs> um, imperial units. So the, the interesting thing is this vertical gap. So how do we get a vertical gap? Now, when, whenever we study concrete or masonry cracks in forensics, um, it is possible that masonry can be lifted. There's various actions that can lift masonry or lift concrete, but concrete is, is intuitively, right? We all know this, it's very heavy. It's a very dense material and gravity is pulling down against everything. If you're, if you're like me and you're getting older in life, you know gravity is pulling down on everything, on, on, on everything around you and everything on you. So the idea, my, my point being is that 99.9% .9 of the time when we see a vertical displacement across an open crack joint, it's not so much because this side has gone up, but it is much more likely that this side has gone down. The left side has gone down. So looking at this photo, it looks more to me like this side has gone down and, and, and this has essentially stayed put, okay? And when this went, this side goes down, it took with it some of this area down here. So I'll clean up some of these arrows. So we're talking about this lower course of block. You can actually see there's a vertical displacement in the block here, okay? And I've looked back at the photos. This isn't just um, this isn't just missing mortar. There's there's actually a vertical displacement here. All right. And so what it looks to me like is that this side is going down. It's taking this joint. Notice this joint isn't cracked here at the bottom, okay? Of the, of this of this corner. And so it's essentially it is taking uh, this block down with it. And this again is staying, you know, it's wanting to stay put, but it's sort of torn between the two. It's not sure if it wants to go down or if it wants to kind of stay put. So it's kind of following down a little bit 
uh, as, as it goes down. Now the question is, is, why would a planter box wall be sinking? What is it sinking into? We have to understand that these planter box walls are sitting directly on the structural deck. It's also important to note that this area in general is the area where we suspect a lot of engineers who have done uh, forensic analysis, who have done um, uh, software analysis. I did hand calculations. A lot of us feel that generally on the pool deck, this is sort of our general starting area. This is the most overloaded area. The columns underneath this area have the absolute most load on them from these planter boxes. They're under-engineered, and then they have 40 years of, of, of concrete uh, corrosion and damage in them. And so that's why this is so interesting because if, if, this is, if this is going down, then that could be an early indication that you have early signs of punching shear happening at one, maybe two columns, but it's not enough that they've all given out yet uh, and, and, and actually caused the collapse. But keep in mind, this damage shows up about three weeks before the building collapsed or partially collapsed, if you will. So there's definitely, I mean, you to, to argue now, now uh, what the confidential source sort of said was about the, that that uh, the 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 engineer, the junior engineer that showed up with uh, Morabito said about this is that well, the reason why this this is uh, this crack is appearing here is because this concrete element is lifting due to root intrusion uh, from the plants. Now, root intrusion from the plants into a, into a wall is like a possibility, but there's a couple reasons why this doesn't make any sense to me. One is this vertical displacement of nearly uh, three centimeters or, or an inch and a quarter, if you will, showed up pretty much like instantaneously. I mean, this wasn't something that gradually, you know, the roots kept growing and it kept pushing it up and pushing it up and pushing it up. So to have three inches of displacement show up suddenly or three, uh, I'm sorry, three centimeters of displacement show up suddenly is very odd. And it does, it's not indicative of how root action works. Two, Roots create more lateral force than they do vertical pressure in a planter box. So what I would expect to see more so than the than the um, than the than the wall segment lifting up, I would expect to see the wall segment kind of leaning or pushing out. You would kind of expect it to see. You might expect to see something like this because of the lateral pressure. If there was too many roots in there, and you might see you might see multiple cracks in order to accommodate this sort of accordion type. Uh, a shoving over of the wall, but we don't see any horizontal displacement in the wall in these photos. And then the third thing is, is because the root intrusion, if there was roots getting in here and then those roots were growing and pushing this concrete element up, you would have, it, the, first off, this would take a long time. It would take nine, 12 months, at least maybe a couple years to push it up three centimeters, which means you would have tons of water staining and organic growth coming out of this crack and down this wall face, but we don't see any of that. The wall face in these photos looks pretty clean. Okay, so unless somebody's out there pressure washing this wall every other day, you're going to end up with organic water staining through this joint. No, no, this joint showed up three weeks before the, the, the building collapsed. It, it prompted uh, whoever was, was you know, the prop, I don't know if it was the uh, board members or property manager or the maintenance man, but it prompted somebody to call Morbido and say, hey, you need to come out here and take a look at this. The junior engineer shows up and he's like, oh, it must be root damage. Well, the other thing too, this is my fourth point about root damage. In order to conclude that this is root damage, you have to cut back these plants and you have to dig down in, in the planter bed and you have to actually be able to observe what's going on here. I just drew like a really funny face. Anyway, you have to kind of be able to observe what's going on in that, in that cavity. You have to actually physically see roots. You can't just conclude there are roots. So I suspect that without any excavation being done, uh, that, that it didn't fit within the paradigm, uh, the mindset of the person who was out there to say, well, gee, maybe the slab is sinking and falling down here, and that's what's causing this vertical displacement, that doesn't fit because nobody's ever seen that. I mean, almost most engineers will go their entire career and never see a building collapse or even partially collapse, okay? So it's not in most engineers' paradigms to think in these terms. So when you come out here and you look at this and you see this vertical displacement at the corner, you, 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 you may not even do a full investigation. You may just conclude, well, it must be root intrusion, and you don't give it a lot of thought. I can see that happening.
I'm not saying that didn't happen. I don't have any proof that that's what the person's thought process. And I'm not saying, you know, that that, that I have uh, uh, any reason to believe that that's what they thought. But that's the conclusion generally that 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 they reached was that, well, this is this wall is being damaged due to root intrusion. So then we challenge that and we question that. And we're going to start looking uh, at the photos in a little bit more detail. So I've turned the photos into black and white and I've increased the contrast so that we can see the paver lines a little better. And I started drawing some lines over the pavers just to see what do I see? What can I find? What can I discover? And one of the things that I found was interesting is that when I start my line right on the paver joint here at the bottom corner, and I draw it to about here, okay? So let's say I'm just gonna call them location one and location two, and I extend that line out to location three, all right, I, I started realizing, hey, that's not matching up with the paver. Now I drew the line right on the paver joint between lines between points one and two, but point three ends up being way out in space. So I said, well, let me come back the other direction. Let's start here. So I start at point four. Actually, let's clarify it. Let's make it a little easier to read. Let's say I start at point A, all right? And I draw that line to where it starts deviating, which is about point B. And then I extend that out to point C. And you can see that there is, there's, there, these aren't lining up, right, with each other. They're not, they're not collinear with each other. And you can actually see that with a lot of these. You'll see this angle here, it kind of goes that way, and then this angle goes that way. And this one goes this way, and this one goes this way. So I thought, well, maybe an easier way to kind of visualize this is why don't we pick, uh, uh, why don't we go ahead and pick point A, which is what the end of where we can see that that uh, uh, paver joint, and we'll pick point one, and we'll just draw a straight line in there, and then we'll see what we can see. So that's what I did in this next image. And so we for each of these lines, I picked the location right at the edge of the joint. It's right on the joint. I made sure to be very careful. I know it's a very pixelated image, um, but we deal with this a lot in in in, uh, in my profession. And then we put the uh, the line right on the joint here, and you can actually see it almost like I mean, look at these over here. This almost looks like a shadow below the red line, but that's not a shadow. That's the actual joint of the pavers. And so what we're looking at here is we're actually looking that, at the fact that the pavers are, and I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating this, but they're sagging between these points. So the pavers are depressed. If we go back and look at this picture and we draw a straight line, I didn't colorize it, I didn't black and white it or anything, and we just draw a straight line from right on the joints. So we'll call this like location A. All right, hopefully my picture's not covering that, okay. All right, so we'll, we'll, we'll put that right on location A, and then we pick a point right, oops, we pick a point right on the joint here, and we'll call that B. And when we draw that line, we can see that the actual joint is not on that line. I'm putting little dots where the actual joint is. But it does converge, okay? So you actually end up with like this sagging area that goes like that. And the center of that sagging area is generally right about, I mean, that line wasn't drawn very well, but it's generally right about here is sort of the center line of where that sagging area is, right at the end of that planter. So I want you to remember that location. Uh, in order to see that a little better, I did go ahead and colorize that picture. I went ahead and drew it. Uh, I blew it up a little bit more and I drew the red lines in there. And you again, you can see the sagging here and you can see this one starts right about here and continues like that. So you can see that sag in the pavers. Now, it could be that the sag in the pavers is there just because they wanted to create some sort of surface pitch for the deck drains that are on the uh, uh, pool deck. So we're gonna look at that next. So here is the drawings put together by uh, Morabito or, or Morbido and uh, this is this is for them to rebuild and reconstruct the, the property. And one of the things I thought was really interesting is um, there's the more I look at these drawings, the more I work with them, the more I realize things aren't really quite very accurate. And so one of the things we're looking at is we're looking at this. We've been looking at this planter box here. OK, and I'm going to I'm going to zoom this area in a little bit for you. OK, so we've been talking about this planter box right here that vertical displacement is right here okay the horizontal crack goes right along this wall and then somewhere right about there and the slab depression that we're we've been looking at is right around here 
And remember, I said it was centered right on the edge of that planter box, this, this sagging area here. Okay, now we don't know how far because the photos don't, don't give us enough context, so we don't know how far that sagging goes. So I, I, I was curious and I said, well, let's, let's make sure that what Morbido drew is actually accurate. And what I'm questioning is, I'm questioning, you know, particularly this drain and that drain and where they line up. So we pull up the 2019, uh, this is from Google, uh, what is that called? Google, not, not Google Maps, but Google Earth, there it is, yeah. So this is from Google Earth and this is the 2019 uh, imagery, aerial imagery. And you can see these drains are here and here, okay? And you can also see that there is some surface staining. So there is a low area of the pavers uh, in this picture. I went ahead and colorized it and increased, or uh, decolorized it and increased the contrast. So you can see that there is a low area generally right here. And it sort of forms a triangle almost between those two drains and some other low, low area spot. So taking this aerial and comparing it back and forth to the drawing and, and taking careful measurements, uh, what I did was I crossed out the, the, uh, the drains that Morbido had drawn and I drew them in the locations that I believe are, are correct, okay? The other thing I did was I overlaid the columns below and this is gonna become really important and, and, and apparent as we get further into this video. I, I drew the column locations below. We're going to be referring to these columns. The, these columns are, are shown in orange. I'm just going to circle them real quick. Okay, so there's six columns. I drew. Now, there's, obviously, there's a lot more columns down here, but these are the six columns that are pertinent to the area we're talking about. Um, and it's also interesting to note that these are the columns that a lot of people feel would have been some of the first to punch through. And they're also a group of columns generally. I think uh, this one maybe not, not so much. Uh, but generally, these columns are all visible after the collapse, still protruding up, showing that the slab had punched through around those columns. That's super important to remember. Okay. Now, the other thing that the photographer took uh, uh, pictures of while they were out there, so they were standing generally here, taking pictures this way, and they were standing here, taking a picture that way. All right. Those are the pictures we've looked at so far, the grouping of pictures. At one point, they walked over to this location and they took a picture of this planter box wall here. And I want to show you that picture here. Now, I have I have like an opinion on why this picture was taken. I mean, usually an engineer doesn't take a picture of something unless there's some issue with it. Um, but the feedback I got back from uh, my contacts at the Miami Herald and and talking about um, their confidential uh, uh, um, uh, source, essentially was the feeling was that, well, this may have just been taken because um, they were talking generally, the, the this condo board was generally talking about maybe adding some lights or something here. But regardless of the purpose of why it was taken, we can certainly see some things that are interesting here. Now, this is a taller planter back box. So instead of having um, one course of masonry and then a 16 inch beam on top, okay, it, which is like what the other planters have. This appears to have two courses of masonry and the 16 inch beam on top. And I feel pretty strongly about that because you can actually see the masonry block cracking in a couple of locations, you know, around here where, where the stucco has gone bad and it has sort of reflected uh, through the masonry um, joints, okay? Now, again, regardless of why the photo was taken, uh, there are some interesting things we can learn. So over here was one of the test locations that uh, Morabito had taken when they did core samples of the concrete below. The pavers were left out for a long time, and then eventually, I guess, people started complaining that it could be a trip hazard, so it was uh, somebody came along and infilled it with some, with some uh, pavers. But you can see that the soldier course, this uh, red brick, did, does not continue around. So, and this matches up with the photos and locations um, from Morbido's own reports. So we know that this was previously the brick area and that they had just loose laid some spare pavers that they had left over into this vicinity. Uh, the other thing that I find that's interesting is you can see a gap. So this, this uh, uh, brick paver here at the bottom would have been mortared in with like a mortar set or like a, it's almost like a thin set, but it's a mortar set, type S mortar usually. 
and and it would have been mortared against the um, stucco or the stucco would have extended down either way. But you have here this black gap between the brick and you have it over here. You have this black gap between the brick, which sort of looks like the brick is almost moving or pulling away from this planter wall. Now, again, none of these individual things um, add up. They, none of them individually stand and tell you anything specifically. But you'll see as we go a little bit long further along that all these things start adding up and really makes you question, you know, what are we talking about? What are we looking at here? What possibly, remember, we've got to remember, all these photos so far all taken two weeks before the building collapsed. Two weeks, right? Two weeks and two days. Okay, so going back to this image. We have that sagging issue. We said the sagging issue was generally centered about uh, on the planter box here. And we know that the sagging issue is right up at the planter boxes, okay? If you look at the photos, it almost looks like it kind of dies down as it gets towards the drain. So again, the drain's not in the picture. They're not great pictures. I can't definitively conclude that, that the sagging that we see in the pavers isn't part of the way the deck is supposed to be drained. However, when you take that in conjunction with the stress we saw in the, in the mortar joints and the masonry for the planter there, and we look at this massive, you know, three centimeter vertical displacement break at the planter wall here, and we've got a long crack down the side, which makes it, which makes it seem like this area is going down, right? And you start adding these things up and you say, well, this is, again, this is all just really interesting, but it doesn't really tell me the whole story. Does, is it proof that there's punching shear going on, early stages of punching shear? I would argue that the punching shear would not have been, on a building that's 40 years old, this is different than testing punching shear in a lab. On a building that's 40 years old, and especially even though the building was under reinforced, it did have reinforcement over these columns. There was still some reinforcement over the columns. And so when the concrete shears, um, the steel would still kind of hold things up for a while, right? They're gonna do their do, do a job for a while. But what's really interesting in my discussions with the Miami Herald is they were able to show me some pictures. Now, these pictures were not taken two weeks before the collapse, they were taken in November of, um, let's see, I think that was November of 2020, yeah. They showed me some pictures of a column. The column that we were looking at was column 76. So this column right here, right in the middle of all the crap we're talking about, okay? And the photographer took three photos of, of, the, of the column, generally standing here and facing this direction on that column. Now, I don't have that photo, I can't share that photo with you but I can describe for you what I saw. So here's sort of an, uh, an outline of, well, from what I remember, <laughs> but I paid very close attention, okay? First off, there was a puddle of water sitting at the bottom of the column. I'm gonna work from the bottom up. In this puddle of column, or in this, uh, in this uh, puddle of water at the base of the column, there was white powder suspended in the water, a lot of it. And it looked to me like, uh, like a calcium hydroxide. So, so soluble calcium carbonate, in other words, or, or pre-calcium carbonate, but it looked like calcium uh, 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 hydroxide dissolved in the water. So it was very white powdery substance in this puddle of water. Now, if I had only told you that alone, that wouldn't be very interesting because we know that the parking garage was flooding all the time. And, and keep in mind, this is, this is essentially a column 76. Okay, so we know that the, the parking garage was flooding all the time. They had trouble getting water out. That wouldn't be super interesting that I told you that there was a puddle. It is a little interesting that there's calcium hydroxide or what appears to be calcium hydroxide, white powdery substance, very predominant in the puddle. This isn't just like a tiny bit. This wasn't a reflection. It was pretty, pretty significant. Um, that really wouldn't surprise probably a lot of you. Now, the, the other thing though that's really interesting is this was shot in three photos. You know, one was kind of like the photo of the bottom, one's like the photo of the middle, and then the, the third one's like the photo up top. So as I'm looking at these, I'm noticing that there is a ton of 
efflorescence. So it's like that white powdery substance. It almost looks like the stuff that you make uh, stalactites out of in caves, right? And it's very ripply and bubbly and it's just, it's just all over the face of this column. I mean, all over the place. And what's really interesting in the photo is you can tell that it is actively wet. If you've ever been in, a, in like in an old cave that has stalactites, if the stalactites are wet and actually actively dripping, they have a sheen to them because they're saturated. They're fully saturated with water and they have water on the surface. So there's a sheen. Well, in these photos, there's a sheen. Now, keep in mind, these photos are not two weeks before the collapse. These show the photos were shot prior to those other photos. These, this was shot in November of 2020. Oh, I'm covering that up a little bit, but that's all right. As we got up to the top of the photo, you could tell that the column was just, you know, completely wet and saturated. And you could see that 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 there was actually rust staining here, kind of, if I remember, it was on, if I recall, it was on the right side, and it was sort of running down. This, this rust staining was coming down from this upper joint on the column. Now, in this garage, and I've looked at other photos, of, we've all looked at like, if you've watched, followed any of these videos, we've, we've done the garage walkthrough, we've looked at tons of photos in the garage. And one of the common things we would see in the garage, assuming like I'm, I'm gonna kind of draw like as if this is the ceiling, okay? We would see um, sort of like blistering paint, you know, and we would see hollow areas where the paint was falling down all over the place. You know, there was the, the ceiling was a mess in there, right? And where you would see that, you would also see some like white powdery substance on the concrete, that calcium carbonate. Now, the reason why is because if I were to draw a cross section through the through the slab and, and you have standing water, whether you have paver, sand, bad waterproofing, whatever, you've got standing water up on this plaza deck, that water is going to soak through the concrete slowly and it's going to precipitate very slowly out the other side or in most cases it evaporates right when it gets to the surface which is why the paint peels off because it's a vapor and vapor will push the paint off through capillary action and then you end up and then you and then it ends up drying and that's why you end up with the um, white efflorescence on the ceiling. I, I should have probably included a photo since we have so many of them, but it just sort of occurred to me now to talk to you about it. When you have so that's so typically you don't see sopping wet water on the ceiling of concrete slabs unless there's a breach in the slab. Now, when we're talking about this column here, and we're talking about this upper area and the middle, I mean, just the whole thing is just soaking wet. There's literally a puddle at the, at the base of this thing where the water's accumulating because so much water's coming in. That tells us, you know, that should tell any engineer that's looking at this thing that we have an actual breach in the concrete at the top of this column. Well, given the fact that the whole building is a plate slab construction, Okay, there's no capitals, there's no beams for most of these columns. It's just a slab sitting on top of a column. The fact that I've got water flowing down column 76 should be an automatic indicator that I may have a, an a, a, a imminent punching shear failure on my hands. The concrete has already cracked and sheared through the top of the slab. I've got water just freely flowing down that open joint. It's rusting whatever steel is there, right? You got like this, a couple steel bars, not much holding this slab up. You've got a couple steel bars in this slab coming through, right? Maybe one, maybe two coming through. I'm trying to draw them in, in 3D for you, if I will, if you will. But you've got rust coming down, which means that rebar is rusting through and, and, and bleeding down the face of this column. And this was back in November of 2020. Now, as far as I know, um, nothing was done about this at all. And so to put this sort of in context, what, what I'm talking about and what I'm focusing here on this column 76, again, is right here. It's right in the heart of where we think the, all the collapsing could have possibly initiated and started. Um, some people think, well, maybe, maybe the connection at the wall was actually the first location and maybe punching shear at the columns was the second issue. But it very well, I don't think any of us are ever gonna have enough evidence to prove one way or the other, but it very well could have been that punching shear was the initiating cause, which pulled it off of the wall over here and then eventually the, pulled down the building. And of course, there's a lot of contributing factors that have to go into this. A healthy building that suffers a punching shear at these locations wouldn't normally bring down the building, but obviously we know the building wasn't very healthy. It wasn't engineered right, it wasn't built right. There's, they had a lot of problems that came together to cause this, this collapse. 
Um, but when you look at that photo of 76 and you see the rust and just the an incredible amount of water. I've never seen any amount of water coming down a column on this property or really any property. Uh, uh, just the amount of water that was coming down, efflorescence and rust coming down that it should have been, in my opinion, a warning that we need to get some post shoring out here right away. And as far as I know, um, that wasn't done. And from November rolled into December, which rolled into January and all the way down to June. Uh, and and, and, and you know, in my opinion, you've got this this crack that shows up, this three centimeter tall vertical differential. This uh, uh, these planters start cracking and sagging and dropping. Um, I can't. I mean, you know, I'm honestly given given the condition of a uh, column seventy six. I'm actually kind of surprised. And given what we know now about how the slab was designed and how the building was was uh, uh, built, I'm actually surprised that it lasted even as long as it did. Um, but I, I I feel pretty strongly that the concrete cracks that we saw uh, at the beginning of this video in the planter box, the horizontal cracks, the vertical cracks. Um, it's more likely, let me put it this way, it's more likely that that is indicative of imminent failure, collapse of the pool deck, uh, than it is that roots were causing damage to the, to the uh, wall. Well, that's all I've got for you today. I mean, uh, the last thing I was going to kind of mention is, you know, the civil case, case has been closed. I opened this video talking about the $1 billion settlement. There's still a couple other little cases that are ancillary to that, but they're they're expecting those to settle as well. And that's what will push them over the $1 because right now they're at like $997 million. But they're expecting to be over $1 billion once all the other civil cases close. The question then comes in with this new information coming out and these new photos and these things that I'm looking at. And from a structural engineer's perspective, and in talking to the Miami Herald, and I think, and, and I don't want to put words in their mouth, but I think, you know, the consensus amongst other engineers that they've talked to is that when they see, when they see what, you know, what, what, what I just described to you at column, at column 76, when they saw those photos, they were sort of alarmed at the same time. And they said, we would want to put post shoring around there. When they were shown photos, when other engineers were shown photos of the cracking at the planter box and the three centimeter vertical gap, pretty much all of us said the same thing to the reporters. We would at least have gone downstairs and looked up at the ceiling to see what was going on with that slab. So my question to you guys is, do you think um, there is the possibility of some sort of criminal case? Um, or do you think uh, you will just never know? Uh, I would like to know your opinion in the comments. And otherwise, thanks for watching.